Welcome to 4550 RPM, remembering past musos born in the 40s and the 50s. I'm your host GK, and in this episode, we're going to have an ever so brief look at the career of Scottish guitarist Ian Banson, best known for his time with Pilot and the Alan Parsons Project. John Ian Banson was born in the Shetland Islands on the 3rd of August 1953, and he began to play guitar when he was just six years old. At age nine, his family moved from the islands to Edinburgh, and at age 15, he played guitar in a local music shop in order to pay for his Gibson SG guitar. While still at school, Ian played in a blues band called East West. This band went on to open for such acts as John Mayles Blues Band, Rory Gallagher, Argent and more. In 1973, Ian joined the band Pilot, which included a couple of former members of the Bay City Rollers, that being Billy Lyle and David Payton. Ian had already done some session work before the formation of Pilot, but it was Pilot which really brought him to the attention of a wider audience. Pilot had a couple of huge hits, the first being Magic from their first album in 1974, which hit number 11 on the UK charts and number 5 on the charts in the USA. Pilot's first album had been produced by Alan Parsons, which would lead to further collaboration down the track. In 1975, Pilot's single January proved to be their biggest, hitting number 1 in the UK, and I can tell you it was huge in Australia, staying at number 1 for 8 weeks. Incidentally, David Cassidy covered this tune on his album Home Is Where The Heart Is. Pilot released a number of studio albums during Ian's tenure as the band's guitarist, and initially they went into the studio to record their first album, that album being from the album of the same name. Now they went in as a trio, including Peyton, Lyle and Stuart Tosh on drums. Now let me quote something here, and you can find the links to my sources in the description box below that will help make this... Uh, part of Ian's journey into Pilot um, a little bit clearer. After signing with EMI in April 1974 as a trio with Stuart on drums, Pilot immediately began recording from the album of the same name in Abbey Road Studios. David picked Alan Parsons to produce the album from a list of 10 staff house engineers offered by EMI who were ready to move up as producers. David was familiar with his engineering work with Paul McCartney and Pink Floyd. Pilot first recorded Just a Smile, which was released as a single on June 7, 1974, but failed to chart. While recording Just Let Me Be, the band just knew they needed the person who played on the demo to do the guitar work. So they convinced Ian Banson to come into Abbey Road to add his guitar to the track. While finishing up recording and mi mixing the album, they realised they needed someone to play either bass or guitar, especially for touring. They auditioned bass players and did not find a suitable match. Then, while they were auditioning guitar players, Ian came by Abbey Road to see how they were coming along. He asked David what he was doing. David replied auditioning guitarists. In response to Ian's, why didn't you ask me? David replied, I didn't think you'd be interested. Next thing you know, Pilot had its fourth member as the band was ready to take off with the release of its first album, a critically acclaimed tour supporting Sparks, and of course, more than a little bit of magic. Okay, so that's how um, Banson ended up um, being Pilot's permanent guitarist. Um, and I think um, for the most part, although he was a guitarist as well, David Payton um, became the bass player. Um, but of course, both of those guys could play either instrument, um, Banson being multi-instrumental himself. Um, okay, so of course I'm, I might be repeating myself here, but um, links to anything I quote directly here or use uh, will be in the description box th below. The links to that will be in the description box below. All right, so they finished off with the term there, more than a little bit of magic. So um, we pick up here where I've written. And of course, this initial album by Pilot featured the hit single Magic, which went to number one in Canada. In 1975, they released the album Second Flight, which fe featured their biggest hit, January. In 1976, Pilot went to Canada to record the album Moran Heights, which included the tune Canada and a couple of songs penned by Ian Banson. During 1977, Pilot, now featuring just Ian and David as permanent members um, uh, from the classic lineup, recorded their fourth album, Two's a Crowd, with Alan Parsons as producer. Now let me read from their website about this project. It's interesting as there are a couple of interesting crossovers. 
So we're talking about the album To's a Crowd. Many consider this album to be Pilot's best work ever. Unfortunately, many fans initially probably never even got to hear it since it was on its way to being grounded before takeoff. After Stuart Tosh's departure, David and Ian stayed away from the limelight but still had the chance to grow closer together as a songwriting team. When they weren't off racing their customised trail bikes, trial bikes on the rigorous hilly courses on the outskirts of Edinburgh, they were in Abbey Road Studios working on either Two's a Crowd or the latest project by the Alan Parsons Project, iRobot. David, Ian and Alan would work on pilot songs one day and then iRobot songs the next. They even found time to provide some guest Scottish vocals for some guy in the studio next door. His name was Paul and the single Mull of Kintyre went on to be the all-time best-selling single in the UK. Two's the Crowd marked not only a return of Pilot's original producer Alan Parsons, but also to those memorable hand claps that are featured prominently on the lead single Get Up and Go. David and Ian had signed with Arista Records and looked forward to the new label showcasing their latest songwriting efforts. The album was released along with the first single, Get Up and Go, in July of 1977. The single got hooked immediately with a riveting Banson guitar solo and a catchy Patton Patton chorus. Unfortunately, it looks like David and Ian had been hooked also. The advance money for the album disappeared in a bungled attempt at empire building by their management. The album was never released in the US, but nevertheless, it's a fine piece of work and is recommended should you be able to find a vinyl copy. Fortunately for fans, in 2005, the album was finally released in Japan on CD for the first time. Unquote. So, Ian went on to do a couple more projects with Pilot, but not until the 2000s. So he might leave his time with Pilot there and talk about Kate Bush and the Alan Parsons Project. But before we get to that, will you please take the time to like and comment, and if you haven't, please subscribe to our channel. Everything we do here is offered for free, so if you like it, please like, comment, and subscribe. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Kate Bush. Ian played on Kate's first four albums, and most notably, it's his solo you hear on her 1978 tune, Wuthering Heights. That tune was huge in Australia and New Zealand, and went to the top of the charts in the UK. The outro solo to that song is one I've always wanted to go on forever. It's one of those, I I like outros that just go on and on, you know, with a beautiful solo. And, um, you know, in some ways it's so simple, so melodic, but it's one of my favourites. Like I say, I just wish it would go on and on, but it doesn't, it fades out. Um, Incidentally, David Payton from Pilot also plays guitar on the song Wuthering Heights. Uh, So as I said, Ian contributed to Kate's first four albums. 1978's The Kicking Side, where on one track he also added backing vocals. Also released in 1978 was Kate's second album, Lionheart. Ian contributed to a number of the songs on this album, including the minor hit Hammer Horror, uh, another favourite of mine. It's just one of those things. Um, When I was a kid, I saw a few Hammer Horror films, uh, and so this one um, sort of um, reminds me of those days watching those early horror films, uh, especially the Hammer ones. Um, Moving on, Ian contributed in a lesser way to Kate's next two albums, Never Forever and The Dreaming. All right, let's now talk a little bit about the Alan Parsons project. Alan Parsons was the producer on Pilot's first album, and the relationship with him was more than that. The Alan Parsons project is essentially the collaboration of Alan Parsons and Eric Wolfson, who in turn used a number of session musicians some appearing multiple times. Alan Parsons' project first album, Tales of Mystery and Imagination, featured three members of Pilot, Ian Banson, David Payton, and drummer Stuart Tosh. Now, I got a copy of this album when it was released at the time, and I had no idea that Pilot was such a big part of the album, basically being the backing band, really. Anyway, Alan Parsons' project's next album, I, Robot, which in my opinion is their best, also featured the aforementioned members of Pilot. And a highlight for me is Ian Solo on I Wouldn't Want to Be Like You. Again, back in the day, I had no idea that this was Ian and that he played that solo. Um, and so, you know, he played a couple of solos on um, a couple of my favourite 
really liked the sound that he had on the guitar and and the melodic way that those solos are played. I had no idea that it was Ian Banson of Pilot at the time. There were, you, um, you know, the internet wasn't around and I had a lot of cassettes in those days and cassettes didn't usually have the amount of information you might get on an, on a, um, a vinyl record, for example. So I had no idea that that was him, but I've always liked both of those solos and, and the songs. I, I guess I should say I do like the songs. So we're talking about the solo on I Wouldn't Want to Be Like You off Alan Parsons Project's album, I, Robot. So, moving on. Ian and David Payton also appear on Alan Parsons Project's third album, Pyramid, their fourth album, Eve, their fifth album, Turn of a Friendly Card, and, and so on and so forth. Indeed, Ian appears on all Alan Parsons Project's albums, right up to and including Freudiana, and I believe the final release, The Sicilian Defence. I think he's also on that as well. Ian was a much sought after session musician and has appeared on over 100 releases. Some I've never heard of, but some to note are sessions with Wings, Steve Harley, Chris DeBerg, John Anderson, Mick Fleetwood, Bucks Fizz, would you believe it, Kenny Rogers, and the list goes on and on. As a guitarist of note, we shouldn't finish any discussion about Ian without talking just a little bit about his gear. Ian in the early part of his career had an early love of Gibson guitars. Uh, I mentioned earlier the SG that he played when he was in his teens. Later he used, amongst others, a 73 Les Paul Custom, a 59 Les Paul, both those, both those are obviously Gibson guitars. Um, and he owned a couple of PRS, Paul Reed Smith guitars, one of which he called the ultimate touring guitar. So there's a bit of kudos for PRS. Um, let me give you a couple of quotes by Ian on the subject of his Les Pauls, and you can find the links to this in the description box below. Quote, I've always loved the Les Paul guitar, and I've played it on the vast majority of records I made. It is very different to a Strat. Many would say less versatile in the choice of sounds available, but it delivers the notes with a spit and kick that no other guitar can match. I dearly love my PRS guitars too. They are built on the basis of a Gibson rather than a Fender and are beautifully made, even if they can't quite outgun my Les Paul. So on to amplifiers. On any record up until 1981, you can be assured that I played my Les Paul Custom through a Marshall 50 head and a 4x12 angle front cab cabinet. The speakers were not Celestians. I replaced them with Goodman speakers. Any Strat sounds on project albums pre-1981 were from a 70s white Strat, which was just a part of many instruments we kept as a kind of project arsenal. It was a truly horrible guitar. In these days, we used... Ke I guess he means in those days. In these days, we used careful mic placement for the basic sound and used the studio's effects if they were needed. I never owned a stomp box. And another quote here by Ian. Guitar players broadly fall into two main groups. Those who consider themselves as Strat players and those who are Les Paul type players. I've always loved Les Pauls. Ever since I was about 14 years old, I wanted to play one. I prefer the sheer power and kick of a Gibson Les Paul. I bought mine as soon as I could afford one. Came from a shop called Take 5 in Shaftesbury Avenue in London and cost me £315 in 1974. That's a lot of do re me by the way. Um, it is a custom model but over the years I have changed bits and pieces and now it looks more like a standard. I suppose it is true to say that I built a career using only a Les Paul and a Marshall 50 watt amplifier. I never plugged anything between the guitar and the amp. If we wanted effects on the sound, we use the studio effects. They are far better quality and besides, I couldn't afford that kind of equipment. This guitar has been with me through everything from the early recordings, Pilot, Parsons Project and Kate Bush. Uh, now you can find these quotes on ianbanson.com and, and I will put a link in the uh, uh, description box below. Okay, well that's it for another episode of 4550 RPM and we dedicate this one to Ian Banson, born 3 August 1953 and who sadly passed away after a long battle with dementia on 7 April 2023. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time here on 4550 RPM. This is Acrolith and Same Chain. Can we provide results for our frustration? 
in a condition that is lacking vision and I can't see that I can't see.